Welcome to the Ghostly Gallery Podcast, a place where we explore the world of horror in film, television, books, and popular culture. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. My name is Bruce Markison. As always, I'm joined by producer and co-host Tracy Asteria. Tracy, welcome to you. What's going on? Not too much at all, Bruce. It's actually it's a beautiful day here in Nova Scotia, and uh, I'm enjoying the sunshine through my window. How's everything with you? Good. Things are things are going well here. We're um, well into spring. Summer's around the corner. And we have a a great guest coming up on this week's show. It is our pleasure to welcome the outstanding author, Grady Hendricks, to the program. A best-selling writer, Grady has authored eight books, uh, six in the fictional area, two nonfiction. His most recent book, the critically acclaimed How to Sell a Haunted House, which I read over the winter. Uh, His other titles include My Best Friend's Exorcism, The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, uh, Paperbacks from Hell, which was one of the works of nonfiction, and also The Final Girl Support Group. Uh, Grady, welcome to the Ghostly Gallery. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, y'all. Absolutely. First off, Grady, I I had to ask you about this nickname that you have been given. I was reading about this in an article done by one of the newspapers in your hometown in Charleston. Mm. And apparently when you were young, somebody started calling you Sunshine. Where does that come from? Well, that's hard to know. Like nicknames, it, it's the origins are, are lost in the mist of time. Uh, but yeah, growing up, I, everyone knew me as Sunshine. No one really called me Grady until I was 19 or 20 and went off to college. <laughs> um, maybe it's because I had red hair. Um, I always tell my sisters it's because I was the boy our parents were desperately longing for and they kept having girls. But uh, yeah, no, lost to the mist of time. But that most people I grew up around uh, and most of our family and family friends call me Sunshine instead of Grady. And you like the nickname? You know, who likes their nickname? <laughs> Obviously, if it's a real name, unless it's one you gave yourself, who likes it? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I think it's very lovely and it's very well, fitting. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's quite kind. <laughs> so before we kind of get into some of these questions, I have a curiosity question for you. Um when you get some downtime from non-writing, what are some of the cool little hobbies that you like to focus your time on? Oof, I don't know, because honestly, I've been down the rabbit hole in the book I'm working on for a really long time. I've mm-hmm. forgotten what life is like out there. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, for me, I guess my wife's a chef, so uh, we're always sort of eating somewhere that she needs to try. Um, although I guess that's kind of work too. Um, (laughs) and you know, I did a lot of film programming for a very long time. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I've got friends running screenings and I still do some screenings just for fun showing like sort of weird old retro stuff at a few theaters. So yeah, that's sort of, but that's not really, I mean, is that a hobby? Is that, or I don't know, but that's usually what I'm, I'm doing or, uh, looking for a thrift store that still sells paperbacks. Oh my gosh. Y'all have to come to Nova Scotia. We have one on every corner. Ooh. Absolutely. <laughs> well, there's there's fewer and fewer in the States. And ever since I wrote that uh paperbacks from hell book, they their horror sections are getting cleaned out by by ravenous fans. So I sort of like I'm glad I stocked up before I wrote that book, but I'm I'm annoyed that I'm not able to to still find stuff. Oh my goodness. No, it's always, it's always a great find to find some really great horror mystery books, you know, oh, kicking yeah. around at some of those old bookstores. Um, speaking of books, um, do you happen to have a favorite author that you enjoy reading or somebody that might have inspired you? Um, inspired me? No. I mean, like everything does, you know what I mean? You're always reading other people's stuff and and being irritated and annoyed that it's better than yours um, and stealing things and stuff like that. Um, I don't really have favorite authors. I've got favorite books. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, like I really love Charles Portis's True Grit. Um, Shirley Jackson, I love We've Always Lived in the Castle. I've become ambivalent about The Haunting of Hill House. It's good, but I feel like we've always lived in the castle. It's just a little more fleet-footed, which appeals to me more these days. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, but but I have weird 
taste like for I went through a long, long Elmore Leonard phase. And now I can't bring myself to read the guy. Like, I think I just burned myself out on him. <laughs> or like, um, I really love Ed McBain's 87th Precinct series, but I only like the books from the late 50s through the early 90s. And I don't like anything else he's written. So it's really, you know what I mean? So it's more about the yeah. books than the author that I follow. Um, I, I don't know why. Oh, interesting. Oh, no, that's actually a really good answer. That's actually, okay. I will say the one author who I think, I think I've loved everything he's written to some extent, uh, uh, Michael McDowell, who wrote Blackwater Saga and Elementals, just really, I would only read him when I'm not writing a book because it makes me feel ill about how bad I am at writing. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, geez. No, that's that's really good to know. I think, you know, a lot of a lot of people are kind of like that. Like I have a couple of authors that, you know, I randomly pick up and that I do enjoy. But it's always great to pick up a new book here and there that you know nothing about. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I wind up reading a fair amount of stuff to blurb it. Um I try not to blurb stuff very often just because it takes a really long time to read a book. And then mm -hmm. I don't want to blurb it if I don't love it, but you're not going to know if you're going to love it or not until you've read it. And, um, but it winds up forcing you to read a lot of stuff outside your comfort zone, which is actually mm -hmm. quite nice. So, Exactly. Grady, one thing I wanted to mention is how we kind of came up with the idea of having you as a guest, aside from the fact oh, yeah. that you're uh, an accomplished and well-known author. Uh, but I first remember you being mentioned by Edward Pettit, uh, the fine oh, yeah. historian at the Rosenbach. As I recall, you were, I think you were one of the guests on Sundays with Dracula, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, I, like a lot of people, um, I I don't know how I met Edward, um, but it was during the pandemic. So it was mm -hmm. virtually. And like a lot of people, I decided to do a podcast when I was uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I had a book called Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires that came out in April of 2020. And usually I do a kind of show instead of an author event when I go out on the road. So I had all this research to do my vampire show. And then there was a pandemic, which was very yeah. inconvenient for me. Um, and so I turned it into a podcast. And I don't think people who do podcasts like it when I say things like this, but I didn't quite realize how much work it was. Um, and so, you know, five years later, I'm just wrapping up the first season of that, which is the 10th episode, which has been a history of vampires. Mm -hmm. But in there, I came across Edward because I think I had a question for him about one of Brand's, well, about Bram Stoker's manuscript of Dracula. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because I was working on my Dracula episode. And then we met and then I wound up doing the Vampire Day. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was great. And also, when I went to Salem with my family early October of last year, we went to a local bookstore and I forget the name of it. But we saw your book, How to Sell a Haunted House, prominently displayed. And I think I happened to mention to somebody working there, uh, oh, do you know much about this author? And uh, the person said, oh, yeah, he did a book signing here. And he was great. He was very friendly. And so that, that along with the okay. Edward Pettit connection, made it seem, all right, we've got to get this guy on. Yeah, that was probably Wicked Good Books in Salem. Um, Wicked Good, yeah. And and Salem is a very weird town. I've only been once or twice, but um, I mean, the Peabody Essex Museum has this amazing spiritualist exhibit that's coming up, which I'm going up for. But I just remember being there for that book event and I got in kind of late and the only restaurant that was still open was this like kind of like sushi place. But one of those sushi places like does everything, does Thai, does Chinese, does sushi. And there was a whole thing going on. I was the only customer and there was a whole thing going on because there was a town scandal that day because someone had dined and dashed and everyone knew who it was. And it was all over social media. And that's when I realized, like, Salem is a really small town. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, for you, it was a circuitous route to becoming an acclaimed author. At one time, you were a freelance journalist, a movie critic in New York City, where you are now. I understand you also worked for a paranormal institute at one point. So how did you go from all of that to deciding, I'd like to write in longer form, specifically, I'd like to write fiction. How did that happen? 
Well, that was an act of total stupidity. I mean, I made a really good living as a freelance writer in New York when you could do that kind of thing um, in the 2000s. And then 2008, and I did cultural coverage. It wasn't like serious stuff. It was interviews, book reviews, you know, that kind of thing. But then um, 2008, the financial crisis, every newsroom cut their budgets. And instead of hiring freelancers, they just beat their staff writers harder to get more work out of them. And uh, so, I mean, I really saw it went from being a really viable gig to people were writing for the byline. Um, They weren't even, you know, getting their fee. And so I sort of was like, okay, well, I've got a very limited skill set here and I'm in my 40s. Um, I can type fast. And I decided sort of it was, I I was going to double down on fiction. And I wound up going to the um, Clarion Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Workshop at UC San Diego for six weeks. And that really, you know, that was sort of a do or die. And um, I did. Uh, And then it was a few years after that before I got a book contract. And then it was probably, I would say, seven years it was probably 2016 2017 maybe 2017 which was the first 17 or 18 which was the first year i made as much money as i did when i was a freelance writer in 2007 so Mm -hmm. you know it was uh it's uh you know no one goes into fiction for the big bucks yeah (laughs) well sometimes you have to make that initial sacrifice to kind of get to where you want to be uh that workshop it sounds like it really helped you Oh, it was huge. But I mean, it was 24 people, 26, 24. Um, and each week, a different writer would lead the workshop. And it was a very, it's a really standard issue critique model, right? You write a story a week, everyone sits around in a circle, everyone reads the story, and your story gets critiqued, or you critique someone else's story, and then you write another story for the following week. Um, and the writers, you know, we had I think one week it was Holly Black, Larissa Lai, Paul Park, Liz Hand, Bob Cray, Kim Stanley Robinson. So, you know, people who got a track record and and they were really fantastic. Um, and it was really the first and, and it's sort of. I think like a lot of people, I was very I was used to writing on deadline and I was used to writing to pay my rent. And mm-hmm. so wanting to do something as. Um, sort of a feat and seemingly pointless as writing fiction, um, really, I was a bit embarrassed by it. You know, I, I, I didn't want to take it seriously because also like if it doesn't work out, then you look like a jerk or I thought of so. Um, but I was surrounded by 23 people who were taking it really seriously. And I, you know, either you take it seriously or you're the the asshole and I don't want to be the asshole. So it really made me step up and sort of take what I was doing seriously and, and listen to what people had to say. And it was, it was a really, for me, life-changing thing. I, if anyone's thinking of being a writer, I really encourage it because honestly, in those six weeks, you'll discover if you want to do it or not. Cause some people legit, they like writing, but they don't want to do it on a professional level, which is totally fine. But this is a way to sort of be like, you know, okay, is this something that's going to be a hobby for me, something I do from time to time? Or is this going to be something I really am going to buckle down on? No shame either. I mean, I've got friends who went to Clarion who went both ways, you know. Um, Some are still writers and translators and things. And some were like, you know what, I'm going to do it in my free time, but I'm going to keep the day job because Mm -hmm. I like my day job. And and I don't want writing to be something that has to pay the bills. I want it to be something I do out of the love, not the, the financial greed. Grady, did it take for you until that that time when you published your first novel? Did it take that long for you to realize, yeah, I can do this. I'm pretty good at it. Or did that revelation come before you publish? Uh, I would say that revelation came much after I published. Okay. Um, uh, but no, it's funny. Um, for me, there were sort of three, two moments, really. Uh, so the first week of Clarion, it was Holly Black was our teacher. And um, she gave us this sort of extra credit exercise, which was like, write a, a thousand words of a short story. And I'm an overcompensator. So I wrote a full on short story and I gave it to her to read. And, you know, you would have each week, you'd have a one-on-one with a different writing, one of the writing teacher for that week. 
And uh, I sat down with her and she's like, look, I've read your story. She's like, if you want, you can do this. You are capable of doing this if you want it. And that mm. for me was like, okay, I can do this. Great. So the only problem here is me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the enemy. Um, but no, the second, the, the other time I felt like, I don't know, I wouldn't even say I made it over a hump, but I think probably, I would say in 2017, 28, actually 2018, um, was the first time I was like, I'm going to do this. Uh, because, you know, until then, I really wasn't making that much money. I was making money, but you get paid in royalties, you know, and so you get paid twice a year. So you're usually paying off the debt you accrued from your last royalty check with your new royalty check. Um, and I really had sort of a crisis with this book I wrote called We Sold Our Souls, which is this, um, it's a riff on sort of the Faustian bargain, and it's about a heavy metal band. And um, it was a really rough book. And it's a book um, where I was, I was really thinking of, of giving it up. I was just like, this is not working out. I'm not able to do this. This is a very scattershot way to be doing this. Um, I had written a book that my publisher wasn't interested in. This book, my publisher was having a really hard time, which for reasons I understand, it needed to be a better book, but it was really a lot of back and forth. Um, and eventually the book got canceled, right? Um, December 22nd. And uh, that kind of sucked because I'd spent almost a year writing it and I you know, was going to have to give back the advance and I, I didn't have it. Um, and I had racked up a lot of debt while writing the book. And I was kind of like, this is it. This, mm -hmm. I mean, like, I, I'm out, you know, this is, it's not too late to go to law school. And, um, and uh, through a variety of things, one of which was the nature of the book I was working on and, and sort of my relationship with the lead character, which sounds a little weird, um, but also just practical necessity. I was like, I can't, I gotta, I gotta do this. And I looked at the calendar and realized that you know, Christmas, you got to do a lot of family stuff. And I also had to sort of figure out what I was going to do to save this book. But then from January 1st, my publisher didn't reopen their offices until January 9th. And so I rewrote the whole book in those nine days. I mean, probably, probably two thirds of the book that was published was written. I mean, then, you know, there was copy editing and another mm -hmm. draft, all that, but it really came from then. And that's, and when the book came out, it flopped. I mean, it really did not do well at all. And if I hadn't had another book on my contract, I probably would not have had a career. But that was the first time where I was like, okay, I, I can do this. Like, I, I can go in, ignore my preciousness, um, and really figure out a book that works. Uh, and I've got the skill set to do it. Um, now, whether I could support myself doing it, who knows? But that was the moment with We Sold Our Souls where I was like, okay, I, I'm capable of doing this. So you basically rewrote the book in the matter of uh, a few weeks and made it publishable, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, I mean, it was a couple of months. All the way, but there was that nine day period where I rewrote the whole thing, and then we did another draft, and then I did copy edits. But yeah, so that was really when it's like, okay, I've got the tool set to whether I use the tools correctly. I've got the tool set to do this. Yeah. No author sets out as a goal, having their work become adapted onto film or TV. And I, I say that because I'm an author, primarily baseball books, uh, not mm -hmm. books from the genre of horror, but it's certainly an achievement to have it happen. And you've had it happen several times. One of your earliest books, my best friend's exorcism, was made into a film in 2022. It's currently streaming on Prime Video. I think it's a, a Prime Video original. How did you react when you got this great news that the film industry wanted you? Um, well, you know, it's always sort of a guarded thing because who knows what the final product's going to look like. And like you said, it you don't set out to do this. So it's funny. I always thought I'd be like, oh, whoa, hallelujah. But by the time it happens, you're kind of like, this is fun. You know, it, it's a nice add on. But um, 
it's it's certainly good for your your bottom line and it's nice in terms of exposure but it really does feel like you know my book got a a, a second job you know mm. like 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 oh this is my book it's a really really good tax attorney but also it moonlights as a um you know um soccer referee uh so you know you feel like your book's kind of gotten a second job doing something yeah. Um, so it's great, but like it, to me, the books are the books and that's yeah. sort of, you know, that's kind of where my focus is. I'm really involved with the movies because I feel like, um, I can help speed up the process in the sense of, I know what the story's about, which oftentimes people don't, um, even if they've read it, it's like that engine that sort of drives it is sometimes hard to see. Uh, and I can guide them to that pretty early on, but yeah, so I'm involved, but, um, it feels, you know, a bit removed. Yeah. How involved you write were... nonfiction or fiction about baseball? Uh, primarily nonfiction. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, just some might allege that my nonfiction is fiction, <laughs> but that's a whole other story. Uh, I'm curious, <laughs> how involved were you in the, the film's production, given that this was the first time one of your books oh, yeah. goes on to film? I mean, did you write the screenplay? Were you on set at all? Tell us about that. I was involved zero. Um, really? I literally, oh yeah, I literally, um, well, you know, it's funny. I didn't have an agent for my first four books. Um, just, I couldn't get one. And, um, so my publisher, I didn't know there were rights I could withhold. So for those books, they actually took the film rights. So, um, they just sort of sold it to these guys. And, um, I read a very early draft of the script and had some not, super complimentary notes about it um and then they sort of were like great uh and i didn't hear from them for three years and then they're like hey you want to come to the premiere um and so i was like yeah okay sounds good um so i was very happy they'd gotten away from that script uh i was kind of worried i was going to get canceled at that premiere because the script had a lot of really problematic elements the first draft um and uh but yeah i mean i thought the actors are great in it um and uh it was fun, but yeah, I had zero involvement. Like it, it was a, it was an ongoing process for three years that I wasn't even aware was ongoing. Now it's listed on IMDb as a horror comedy. Is that reflective of what you wrote or not? I don't know. Like people say my stuff's funny. It doesn't seem funny to me when I write it. Like when people say it's funny, I'm like, oh great, you know, I like, I like funny. Um, it's weird. Horror and comedy are one of those weird things that people are like. It's it's a bit like um, uh, uh, putting salt on chocolate. It's like, what? How is that possible? Uh, oh, and then it's all people can talk about. Um, but I don't know any horror horror books are different. I mean, there's definitely some grim, dark horror books out there. Um, I try not to write them because, like, I spend a lot of time with my books, and so like, mm-hmm. if I'm spending a lot of time with someone, I want them to have a sense of humor. Um, I, I don't want to hang out with a humorless book for a year. Um, but I can't think of any horror movies that don't also have comedy in them. Like, mm, I don't know. Even The Exorcist has a couple of laughs in it. There's that great uh, Kinderman kind of like double act with the priest and Blair Witch Project. I mean, as grim as that movie gets, the first 20 minutes is a parody of reality documentary filmmakers. Alien has that Harry Dean Stanton Yafet Kodo double act. Mm. Uh, the Thing has one of the great laugh out line, out loud audience lines in it. So yeah, I don't know any horror movies that don't have some jokes. Um, so yeah, my yeah. stuff, people tend to think it's funny, but I also think that's because I'm making it realistic. Like with my best friend's exorcism, I was thinking, you know, who would be an exorcist and you know there was a big uh the power brothers with that big bodybuilders for christ thing in the 80s um where they do feats of strength but also praise the lord and i was like oh that'd be a great exorcist there's someone who's really putting it out there but then if you're doing an exorcism those things go on a long time so you're gonna have to eat you're gonna have to have snack time Mm -hmm. you're gonna have to like stay hydrated you're gonna do some some protein loading at some point so you know you start to put the reality principle in there and it does get a little less po-faced to pick up on something you said i I think sometimes when a horror movie comes out especially it's you know it's an earlier era and it's horrifying it's terrifying like in the exorcist when 
Linda Blair's character, her head spins all the way around, even though it's sure. some sort of an anima, animatronic doll. Um, and then I, you know, I show that to my daughter in, you know, 2022, and she's laughing at it because it does look a little bit goofy all these years later. So yeah. I, I guess it can change from horror to comedy simply based on the era that we're in. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, um, horror is kind of unforgiving in a lot of ways. Like, it's um, it's kind of like, a, like you said, if you take, I'm sure there's a mathematical formula here, but a horror movie, it's kind of like someone turns on the lights inside that haunted house a little more every year it exists. So by the time you're 30 or 40 years down the road, it's like you've got these spooky monsters, but they're walking around in a fully lit room and people are like, I can see the zipper. I can see the scenes, <laughs> you know? Yeah. In a way, the books don't date quite as badly, uh, which is kind of nice. Now, two other books that you've done are scheduled to either become films or TV series with HBO Max. One of them is the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, and the other is the Final Girl Support Group. And I, I assume yeah. that these are either in production or will be in production soon? Still, still working on those scripts, man. Working on those scripts. Final Girls, I'm just involved as a producer, and they're they're looking around trying to trying to do notes and and get the script into shape. And then uh, Southern Book Club, I'm one of the writers on, and I know the team on it really well. And again, it's one of those things where there's a lot of chaos in Hollywood right now. So um, mm. it's it's people are being very picky about scripts these days because uh, there's less money than there used to be. So everyone yeah. wants it perfect, even though there's no yeah. such thing. Now, which one is going to be the TV series? Uh, both are apparently going to be TV series. Oh, both. Um, okay. Yeah, there was a brief moment where Final Girl Support Group was going to be a film, but they they walked that back to a TV series again. Yeah, I was just curious: did the writer strike and the actress strike? Did that have any impact on the projects that are being worked on right now? Oh, huge. Yeah. I mean, work yeah. stopped on everything. And because yeah. everything was in script stage, um, mm -hmm. it all came to a screeching halt. And, you know, I'm in the screenwriters union um, and I was really, really incredibly lucky um, to also write books because, I mean, I was walking picket lines with people who were, you know, going to the food bank uh, mm -hmm. because they didn't have any money coming in. There were no steaks in the freezer. And, um, you know, these were folks who were out there walking a picket line, you know, six hours a day, eight hours a day for the union. And, you know, the union was doing it be its best to keep them fed. But people made real sacrifices. for that. I was I was very, very proud of my union for that. Um, I, on the other hand, was doing just fine <laughs> with my books because I'm amphibious. And uh, so, you know, yeah, I felt a little guilty. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's, it's, there's definitely like, I was watching that pretty closely. Um, I have a few friends in the industry and you know, the, the impacts are everywhere and there's still the whole AI conversation about, right. you know, that kind of thing. I don't know if that was, I don't know if that was actually resolved during the strikes or if that's still kind of like a side there were some, topic. There were some protections put on, which are better than no protections. Mm -hmm. But again, it's technology that's developing. So you don't know what to protect yourself from because it's changing a lot. So it's that's sort of an, uh, that's a situation that's just going to be so fluid and dynamic moving right. forward. Grady, let's talk about your most recent book, How to Sell a Haunted House. Uh, incredibly successful, became a bestseller on the New York Times list. It's not a traditional haunted house story. I went into it maybe thinking it would be. I don't know why. I thought that I, the title should have indicated otherwise. But it's a story that involves demonic doll. Uh, so in it, that's an interesting twist. How did this story come about for you? Well, there were two things, one of which was um, I wrote it during the pandemic and I missed my family. And I wanted to spend time with a family. So I decided I'd make one up. And um, and I had sort of set that as a challenge for myself because it's hard to write families. Um, families are all backstory, you know, like uh, it, it's all inside jokes and things that happened before you were born. Um, and so that was sort of my challenge. And if you're going to write about a family, you're going to write about a haunted house. Like haunted house books are almost inevitably about families, uh, family secrets, family curses family ghosts, family heirlooms. 
And then I had been a, a puppeteer for a while in university. And I was like, you know, there's a ton of old paperbacks with haunted dolls and puppets, but there's really nothing new. Uh, and I was like, that would be really fun to do something with. Um, and then, you know, that was kind of mean to do to people. Uh, and then sort of, sort of that, that's its disgusting origin story. Um, I think, you know, haunted puppets are disgusting. Uh, and I have now been on the road with this book and heard more haunted doll stories than I wish I'd ever heard in my life. Um, they are also disgusting. So um, I feel bad for contributing to the problem and not being part of the solution. <laughs> I'm curious, was there any influence from Child's Play or going further back, Trilogy of Terror? No, I think the big, I try not to read stuff in what I'm writing as I do it. Usually I'll read one thing. Like when I wrote, when I wrote Southern Book Club, I read Dracula again and left it there. And then I read a ton of books afterwards to sort of like do the show for it, do the research for that. So with this, I really just relied on memory you know like books i remembered although i did reread um shirley jackson's haunting of hill house for this mm -hmm. one to sort of prep myself to dive in but um yeah i mean uh, listen i love trilogy of terror and i love child's play but but child's play had so little influence it was never a movie i loved as a kid um i actually feel like magic the william goldman novel actually probably had mm -hmm. more to do with it, and I still haven't seen that movie with Anthony Hopkins, but the book is phenomenal with that. Yeah, it's a pretty good movie. I, I wouldn't put it at the same level as those other two, but hey, anything with Hopkins is going to be decent. And it's, oh, yeah. It's got some great moments. Now, this book, How to Sell a Haunted House, like many of your books, is set in Charleston, where you grew up. Yeah. Aside from that fact, what is it about Charleston that makes it such a good setting for horror? Well, people from Charleston can't shut up about Charleston. Uh, so I think I'm, I fall victim to that. You know, it, it's kind of like um, Chicago, like people from Chicago, they're always talking about Chicago. And you're like, you know, I'm a Chicago boy. You lived in L.A. for 23 years. Ah, I'm a Chicago guy. Uh, where do I get a good Chicago <laughs> dog? It's like I. I don't know, man, the same place you've been getting up for, for the entire 30 years you've lived in New York. Um, but uh, but Charleston is obsessed with Charleston. Um, so that's part of it. And the other part of it is it's less about Charleston's sort of appealing characteristics that inherently lend itself to this kind of stuff and more about the fact that I know it so well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, writing a book is really tricking an audience into thinking that you really know what you're talking about. And Charleston is a place I know. I mean, I, I do a lot of research for my books, but at least here I'm starting out like, you know, with a pretty decent head start. Uh, if I wrote another book about Charleston set today, I'd actually have to research it from scratch just because it's growing so fast and mm. it's changed so much. Interesting. Now, the main character in the book is Louise, whose parents have just been killed in a car accident. They leave behind their house in Charleston, so Louise goes back there to prepare it for being sold. She really has no intention of living there. At first, Louise is a sympathetic character. Then as we go along, kind of gradually, we start to realize maybe she's not the hero and the martyr that she makes herself out to be. Uh, and I thought this was a very interesting uh, character development. When you set out to write this book, is that the approach you wanted that you, you wanted to make her seem kind of very good and holy and, and then gradually chip away at that? Or is that something to change oh, sure. dream? No, 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 absolutely. From the beginning, man, take down the big sisters. That's my, that's my theme. Um, I got three of them. Let's, let's take, let's have Adam. Yeah. Um, but you know, no one is, I mean, we all, it's interesting. Um, you know, in our family, we dealt with something where a family member really went through a period where they were remembering stuff very differently from the rest of us. And it, you get, and it really is, it throws everyone from a loop, for a loop. Uh, and I wanted to do that with Louise, where this idea of whose version of their family history was correct was the fight between her and Mark. You know, mm -hmm. which version of this story is right? Um, because, you know, 
I certainly know what the true story of my family is, but my sisters sometimes disagree. Um, and <laughs> I think it reflects poorly on them, but I do my best to sort of play along and, you know, bless their hearts. They try. Um, but I do think that's a big thing in families, like which version of our history is the right version. Yeah. Um, and, you know, especially when someone dies, that it all comes up for grab. And even more when parents die, because then it's everyone's relationship gets rejiggered, you know, like everyone's relationship changes. So, um, and also, you know, I really wanted to write about a dude. I wanted a guy to be one of my lead characters alongside Louise, her brother, Mark. And I love guys like Mark, you know, they're just shambling train wrecks who are a hell of a lot of fun, but, you know, they're fun for about five or six days and then they get tiresome. Um, and I really wanted him to have his day in court. Mm. Now, Louise is a character. Is that based specifically on one of your sisters or is it sort of collective? Um, actually, Louise is not based on any of my sisters. Some of the relationship okay. stuff is, but. No, there's someone else she's based on that is not one of my, this is actually not a family member. Um, usually most of my characters are based on someone or a combination of people, but it's rarely who people think it is. And sometimes it's something as simple as someone I saw on the subway. Sometimes it's yeah. someone I've known all my life. But, you know, it's funny when people do that question where they say, oh, you know, which actors do you, what would be your dream casting for this book if it's made into a movie? I'm terrible at that because in my head, these are all really specific people, um, mm. you know, like, and so I can't get past my image of them to see them as someone else. Yeah. That's interesting. You mentioned the the brother, Mark, a uh, very interesting character. He's portrayed as this real ne'er-do-well, at least from mm. Louise's perspective, but the tables again turn. We start to get maybe a fuller, maybe more accurate portrayal as we go along. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, that's the thing where um, everyone always thinks they've got your number, right? Like every sibling thinks they have their sibling's number. I know what you, oh, you say you're going to visit mom because it's Mother's Day and you always do. But I know you're going to visit mom because you want to see how many miles are left on her car. Like, you know, like we we all think we, you know, you want to visit her because I can't this year. We all think we have our siblings numbers. And sometimes we do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't. And I wanted this to be a case where Louise is very confident she has Mark's number and she really doesn't. Yeah. Now, there's a comic element here, especially in the way that the dolls act, at least some of the time. Some interpret the story more humorously. Some are maybe more like you, more seriously. What was your intention going in? I, you know, it's funny. Uh, I really wanted this book to feel real mm. and honest. Um, and so for me, it's less... I mean, listen, if you have a horror scene, if you have a joke, you want it to land, you want it to work, you want it to be good... Uh, and you really engineer that, you know what I mean? Like, ah, oh, I need another comma here. I, you know, I need to like, ah, oh, let me just put this in here. You really get into the math of that. But in general, sort of the overall effect, I really wanted it to feel genuine and real and sincere. Um, and so that was sort of what I was going for more than horror or comedy. Yeah. Um, there's a Stephen King quote where he uh, said, you know, some people may think my books are good. Some may think they're bad. People have different opinions about which are which, but I hope they all feel true. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I really want my books to feel true, that there's a little blood on the page. One of the things I love is the uh, the sort of battle cry for one of the dolls, the Takawiwi. Uh, ah. -wee. And um, yeah. every once in a while, I'll walk into the living room. My wife's in there and I'll yell that out. And, you know, she thinks I'm crazy already. Uh, how'd you come up with that line? That's great. Honestly, it just popped into my head. And <laughs> it wasn't until people started saying it that I was like, oh, that's how you pronounce it. It was <laughs> it was like just popped in my head. And um, it's really taken on a life of its own. I mean, I've seen people with it stitched into jackets. Someone told me they're going to get a tattoo. It is like, I'm like, please don't do that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it really is wild how much it's sort of like taken on a life of its own. Yeah. 
uh, worked out really well. Now, the praise for the book has been extremely high. Uh, were you surprised by how good the reviews have been? Oh, yeah. Um, this When I finished this book, my editor and I were both like, well, you know, it's it's a weird, sad book. You know, we're proud of it, but better luck next time. This one's, you know what I mean? This is this is sort of our, our first pancake here. Um, we'll try again. We'll do better. Uh, so we had no idea it would even sell. Like, we really thought it was just too weird and too <laughs> sad. Um, you know, and so, yeah, we were totally surprised. Now, when you say we, are you talking about family or... Oh, no, my editor and I. Your editor. Your editor wasn't thrilled. Yeah. Uh, no, no, we were very proud of the book. We just both thought people weren't going to like it. Uh, you know, we just thought it was too weird. It was too... N- name name that name that bad quality. We were like, we both liked it a lot, but, eh, you know, better luck next time. Well, it's it's done extremely well for you, uh, as have some yeah. of your other books. But this this one has has really uh, caught hold, and it's it's great to see. In terms of writing, tell us, Grady, about your next project. It's called Witchcraft for Wayward Girls, and I understand it's going to come out sometime in twenty twenty five. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sometime, I agree. Um, so supposedly January fourteenth. It was supposed to come out in August, but I needed more time. So it's um, a witch book, and it's set in a home for unwed mothers in 1970. Uh, and it's about a bunch of girls who get sent there when they get pregnant as teenagers and find, you know, in the 70s and especially the late 60s, there was this real occult boom. And there were all these paperbacks being published, you know, love charms for new brides and, you know, how to be a sensual witch. And these girls find one of these books and um, it actually works. Uh, and man, I don't know. I'm I I'm sweating this one. It's it it's been about as hard to write as how to sell a haunted house, which took an enormous amount of time and had I write a lot of drafts. Um and the first draft of this book didn't even have witches in it. Um, so it was uh it's been a long road and I've still got my editor breathing down my neck for this Friday deadline in, in four days, three days. So it's, it's been a lot. I, I like it and I also hate it simultaneously. So I don't know what people are going to think. It sounds really good though. It does. It sounds really good. Um, Speaking of your writing, um, you do write some horror genre, but is there any other kind of genre that you would like to take a crack at writing in the future? I mean, you know, it's hard because I have a feel for horror. I like horror. I know what horror can do. Um, and I feel like genre is such a marketing label. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I pitched my publisher on a book at one point that I was like, this is right in my wheelhouse. And they're like, that's a thriller. That's not horror. We hired you to write horror. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, it's a thriller. Okay, I guess. Um, I love reading crime fiction. I'm not sure I want to write crime fiction. Um so yeah, so for me, it's like horror is what I do. I'm not sure I have a big urge to go somewhere else. It, it always, you know, Stephen King writes horror as well. I mean, he's written a few horror novels and horror short stories. And, you know, some of them quality, I mean, their quality is terrific. It's as good as his horror. But it always feels like someone playing dress up to me because, mm-hmm. you know, in my head, Stephen King writes horror. And so to me, I'm not sure I would feel real writing something mm-hmm. that wasn't horror i'd feel like i was sort of like cosplaying as another kind of writer okay oh interesting um if we can go back to something that you mentioned a little bit earlier in this conversation um bruce had mentioned that you worked at the paranormal institute can you share a little bit about that yeah sure i mean the american society for psychical research is what it was called mm-hmm. it was founded in a 1885 by William James. And it was, it started out investigating mediums uh, and it's just been around ever since. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, they do a fair amount of research, a lot of art preserving their archives, which are vast and and fascinating. Um, They run, they publish a peer reviewed journal called the journal of the ASPR surprisingly. Um, 
But yeah, I got the job. I just responded to a Craigslist ad for an office manager at a nonprofit. And it turned out to be the ASPR. And I stayed there for about five years answering phones and doing mailings and dealing with membership issues. And I spent a lot of time in the archive. Um, wow. And I'm, you know, it really, for me, it was a fantastic place to work. Mm-hmm. My my boss was a really smart person. And, you know, I really, really had a lot of admiration for her and sort of her take on all this. Um, and yeah, so it was, for me, it was a really great place. And answering the phone there really taught me how to shut up and listen to other people. <laughs> Oh my goodness. That sounds like such a cool place to just be a part of and to kind of explore a little bit. So oh, that's, that's so cool. I mean, it was, but it was also, you know, it was also a nonprofit. So, you know, right. you, one minute you're, you're hearing someone on the phone talk about this very emotional encounter they had with the, what they feel like is the spirit of their dead grandmother. And the next mm-hmm. minute you got someone on the phone yelling at you because their journal is two weeks late in the mail um, and how dare you? And they're going to sue you for mail fraud. So, you know, it was like, it was very, um, it, it was a member, it was a membership based nonprofit. Take care of members is challenging. Yes, 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 it can be. <laughs> um, and I have one more final question. Oh, yeah. Um, I did notice on your website that you also have a podcast. Yeah. Um, can you chat a little bit about that and share sure. some info? Sure. So Super Scary Haunted Homeschool, I started it, like I uh, mentioned in the pandemic, just Mm -hmm. I was all prepped to do a book tour for Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. And I I usually do a show that's about something the book's about. So like with Final Girl Support Group, the show is a one hour history of murder books and murder movies. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was all ready. And there was a pandemic. And so I started repurposing all this research I had into the podcast and it rapidly got out of hand. So I'm about to wrap up episode nine or 10, sorry, which is the end of season one, which is just Mm -hmm. all about vampires. But it goes from sort of the first, I guess, true accounts of vampires or the first reported encounters of the vampires in the 17th century in um, Serbia. And then it moves on up through the early 19th century, John Polidori, the black vampire, which was the first American vampire story um, about a Haitian vampire, um, moves through Dracula, comes through Hammer Films, the 70s sort of romantic vampire. I just released the Anne Rice episode, but I do a ton of research um, these days, probably for the last five episodes. I've had a full cast and I work with two producers or an engineer and a producer. Um, and, you know, we have actors and all kinds of scripts and all kinds. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, so, yeah, it's um, if you want to check it out, try the uh, Ann Rice episode that just came out or the um, or the Black Vampire episode, which was about sort of the 70s, had this brief boom and black vampires like blade and blackula and ganja and mm-hmm. hess so uh but yeah I'm, I'm really proud of it but man it takes me forever to do an episode oh my gosh i've favored it in my in my web browser so i'll definitely be checking yeah. that out that Thanks. is so cool thank you so much oh this is exciting thank and you. that is at www.buzzsprout.com b-u-z-z-s-p-r-o-u-t Dot com. So that's Grady's uh, podcast. Grady Hendricks, one last question for you. Uh, when you're done writing Witchcraft for Wayward Girls, which is any day now, what are you going to do? Read another book? Go to the movies? Sleep for a while? What's the plan? Yeah, for about a month, I'm doing nothing but reading uh, and housework that has sadly fallen behind. And then I start my next book. These books are, these are my life. So yeah. About uh, probably in September, I'll be starting the new one. Very good. Uh, Our guest has been uh, best-selling author and critically acclaimed writer Grady Hendrix. He's written eight books, six horror novels, uh, most recently How to Sell a Haunted House, and then coming out next year, January 2025, Witchcraft for Wayward Girls. Grady, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thanks for having me, man.
Our thanks to Grady Hendricks, the terrific author, and of course, to Tracy Asteria, the terrific co-host and producer. We thank them. We thank all of you for listening, for joining us in this Museum of the Macabre, and we hope we'll see you next time right here in the Ghostly Gallery.